One of the few times that I ever received a speeding ticket. Eight years ago, I was leaving a wedding and it was in a part of Texas I had never been before. And I was turning left out of the venue and went up over a bridge and at the bottom of a bridge was a police officer waiting with a radar gun. And I, again, I had never been in this area and I had no idea what the speed limit was. <clears throat> he pulled me over. I was doing 50 in a 35, I think it was, 435 or 40. And I, he was talking to me and I was explaining that I had no idea I was, you know, had no idea I was speeding, had no idea what the speed limit was, uh, was new, and the area was there for a wedding. And not in so many words, but basically the police officer said, ignorance is no excuse. So I got a ticket. And the more I thought about that, the more angry it made me because I'm thinking, that's not fair. I didn't know what the speed limit was. I didn't have Google Maps to tell me what the speed limit in that area was. So, so why should I be penalized? Because I didn't know what the speed limit was. And yet, throughout the multiple examples that I'm sure we've heard anecdotally and maybe even for ourselves, that same application, that ignorance of the law is no excuse, keeps coming up. I want to talk a little bit about ignorance this morning. Knowing that the idea of ignorance and, and the irony, irony there is that we don't, it's what we don't know. It's a lack of understanding. It's an unawareness or being uninformed, a lack of knowledge or perception. And you know, there's that old saying that ignorance is bliss. Well, ignorance isn't bliss. And I can attest to that because I got a, a ticket eight years ago for it. Well, Thomas Jefferson once said, if ignorance is bliss, why aren't more people happy? And I thought that was a pretty good quote. Because it's the recognition that this, this phrase that people use so often, that ignorance is bliss, is in reality very, very bad uh, uh, wisdom, is very bad, uh, a bad saying. And I think sometimes maybe people use it ironically or they use it sarcastically. Nowadays, I don't, I've never actually heard anybody actually use it for the sake of actually defending the idea of not knowing something. We live in an age where at least information, a lot of information is available to us at our fingertips. Now, whether that information is based in fact or not is something we have to use wisdom to discern, but information is available all around us. And the idea of ignorance, especially when it comes to God's word. Having access to what God's word says is crucial because in 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 11, Paul, as he's writing to the saints in Corinth, he is addressing the issue that apparently had been dealt with from 1 Corinthians chapter 5. We talked a couple of weeks ago about that man who had his father's wife and Paul instructed them to do something about it. Well, it appears here in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, Paul is addressing the fact that they did do something about it. And in verse 9, Paul says, For to this end I also wrote that I might put you to the test, whether you are obedient in all things. Now whom you forgive anything, I also forgive, for I indeed have forgiven, uh, for if I indeed I have forgiven anything, I have forgiven that one for your sakes in the presence of Christ. Verse 11, lest Satan should take advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. And so Paul instructed them to receive this one who had repented, who had acknowledged his sin and made himself right to welcome that individual back in. That was part of this instruction from Paul. Don't, don't cast him out and, and then leave him out even after he's repented. You welcome him back in because now he's doing what he's supposed to be doing. But Paul is basing this on this concept of we're not ignorant of Satan's devices of the means that he uses to try to get within our heart and our mind to either create division among us or to try to draw us off to believing something that is wrong or to doing something that is wrong. Well, the fact of the matter is, is that through God's word, we are informed about Satan's devices. And that's part of what Paul's point here in verse 11, lest Satan should take advantage of ignorance and that's exactly what Satan's looking to do. Ignorance of God's law, ignorance of not knowing what God's word says and whether it's about some broad concept or a specific application. 
Not knowing what God's word says is one of our worst enemies in that sense, because that's the tool Satan is going to use to take advantage of us. This is why Paul in, is applying this in this scenario so that he doesn't use this situation to create a schism between you and this brother who's repented or calls this brother to be discouraged and fall back, fall away again. He doesn't want Satan to be able to take advantage of the Corinthian brethren. Therefore, we are not ignorant. Well, this term, not ignorant or not having knowledge, or sometimes it's translated unaware, or sometimes the phrase, do you not know, is the same term, being ignorant or unaware, uninformed. And I'll look at a couple of places this morning where this term is used to describe something very broad and very applicable for us. For instance, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, starting in verse 1, Paul writes about the things that have happened in the past. And in particular, the Old Testament instruction of, and, and, and record of what Israel did. How Israel often fell away from the Lord and didn't do the things that they were supposed to do. And Paul, from the very get-go here in verse 1, says, Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware. Here's our term, ignorant. I don't want you to be ignorant or uninformed that all of our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. All were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. All ate the same spiritual food, verse 4. All drank the same spiritual drink, verse 5. But with most of them, God was not well pleased. For their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. And these things became our example to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Now, Paul begins this whole thing. He says, I don't want you to be ignorant that these people, our fathers, they were committed to doing what God had instructed them to do through Moses. They followed Moses in the wilderness. In fact, the very concept there in verse 2, all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and the sea. That, that sense of obedience and that sense of trust in going into the midst of the sea when they left Egypt. So here they, were, they are, they've committed themselves to serving Jehovah through what Moses told them. And then what did they do? They turn around and they are not doing the things that they ought. These things are written as examples to the intent that we should not be like they were. Ignorance can lead to making the same mistakes of the past. Just as committed as they should have been. Israel to doing what God told them to do through Moses, they then turned and lusted after evil things. And we have to be aware of the dangers of repeating the, the past. Very people uh, who are supposed to be people of God and people of faith, people who are seeking to obey Jehovah, they turn around and then don't do it. Why? Because of what they wanted to do. That's why. And that is a danger for us, that Satan can use our ignorance against us. If we're not constantly reminding, and the term, the concept of ignorance here isn't so much that they weren't told God's word. They were. The ignorance is, I don't want you to be unaware of that. what then happened. Despite knowing the truth, they then turned and did what they wanted to do anyway. And we can't be like that. Paul in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and in verse 13 in a passage that provides all of us great hope and great assurance. Usually this is read at a graveside or funeral because for that very reason, especially for those who have died in Christ Jesus. Paul begins here in verse 13 by saying, I do not want you to be ignorant brethren concerning those who have fallen asleep, those who have died, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. And Paul goes on to describe how that the dead in Christ will rise first. On that day when the trumpet sounds, when the Lord comes to redeem the saved, the dead in Christ will rise first. They haven't missed out on anything. And their hope is not lost in any way. And that's why Paul says, I don't want you to be ignorant, brethren, like people of the world who sorrow as others who have no hope people of the world who have no hope in a resurrection one day, hope of a home in heaven, they sorrow knowing they're not, they don't believe they're ever going to see their loved ones ever again. 
because they have no hope for a future one day. Those who have died faithful in the Lord, however, we don't have to sorrow in that way. We sorrow in the sense that we're going to miss our loved one or miss our brother or sister in Christ while we're here on this earth. But it is limited in time. One day we're going to be with them forever in heaven. That gives us that assurance. That gives us that sense of peace and understanding. That's why Paul didn't want them to be ignorant. Here they are sorrowing over those friends and loved ones who've died in Christ Jesus. And now they're gone. And they're, we're never going to see them again. And Paul says it's not the case. And I don't want you to think that. In 1 Timothy chapter 1 and in verse 12. Paul uses himself as an example of one who basically said the exact same thing I did to the police officer, which was, I didn't know that the law said I couldn't do that. I didn't, I didn't know what the law was. Well, Paul kind of uses the same concept of the fact that what he did regarding persecuting the church, he thought he was convinced he was doing what was right. It's kind of like if I had been convinced I was actually doing the speed limit because the speed limit is 50 miles an hour. Well, I'm absolutely convinced it's 50, but in reality it wasn't. Well, in 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 12, Paul says, I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has enabled me because he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, although I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an insolent man. But I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. Now be very careful here. Notice what Paul says. I did it ignorantly in unbelief, but I obtained mercy. Well, what does that mean? He obtained mercy because he did it in ignorance. <coughs> because it goes to the root reason why Paul did what he did. He did what he did because he thought he was serving God. That's what Paul's goal always was. Even when he was under, under the old law, following the old law, doing those things, persecuting the saints. He sought to be pleasing to Jehovah. That was his goal. When he learned otherwise, that he was in fact doing the exact opposite of serving Jehovah, he then changed his actions and changed his conduct and sought to obey Jesus. Thus, Paul obtained mercy. Why? Because his desire was to do what God wanted him to do. But Paul was still ignorant. He didn't know better. Thus, verse 14, the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love, which are in Christ Jesus. Well, Paul, you did it ignorantly, so you shouldn't have been held accountable. You did it ignorantly. You thought you were serving God. You had good intentions. You meant well, and at least for Jehovah, to, to serve Jehovah. So surely Jehovah doesn't hold this against you. But what does Paul go on to say in verse 15? Paul says, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. And why does he refer to himself as the chief of sinners? Because he persecuted the church of God. But you didn't know better, Paul. You didn't know that what you were doing was wrong. You thought you were doing what was right. So why could God hold that against you? Because ignorance of the law is no excuse. That's why. Because despite the fact that Paul didn't know better, he was still doing that which was wrong. And so Paul refers to himself, not that God refers to Paul as the chief of sinners. There's no such thing as the chief of sinners. But Paul considered himself chief of sinners because he persecuted the people who were doing what was right. That's where the danger of ignorance comes in. Amid all of these leading to the mistakes of the past that we ought to be learning from, leading to sorrow as others who have no hope, forgetting that there's a home in heaven waiting, to our daily lives and application of serving God the way we should, it can lead somebody to think that I'm okay and I'm doing what's right, even if I'm not doing what's right. That's one of the dangers of ignorance. In Acts chapter 23 and in verse 1, Paul, as he's before the Sanhedrin, he looks earnestly at the Sanhedrin and he says, Men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God unto this day. Meaning, even when he was persecuting saints and dragging them off in chains... He was in good conscience because he thought he was doing what was right. That did not make him innocent. 
And in this way, that whole phrase, ignorance is bliss, is completely obliterated when it comes to God's word. That ignorance was not bliss for Paul. And if Paul had remained in his ignorance and remained in his sin, he would have been lost. Thus, the mercy of the Lord. Jesus appeared to him on the road to Damascus in the bright light. Told him to go into Damascus and wait. And Ananias comes. And then Ananias tells Paul to arise, be baptized, and wash away your sins. Calling on the name of the Lord. In Romans chapter 2 and in verse 1. Paul addresses individuals who are hypocritically using God's word to justify themselves and at the same time condemn others. This fits very well with the idea of thinking of doing what's right, but in reality doing what's wrong. But notice what Paul specifically says. We're starting in verse 1 of Romans chapter 2. Paul says, therefore, you are inexcusable, O man, whoever you are who judge. For in whatever you judge another, you condemn yourself. For you who judge practice the same things. That is the very definition of hypocrisy. Verse 2. But we know. That the judgment of God is according to truth against those who practice such things. Notice the stress, the emphasis here on the knowledge of what God's word tells us. We know that the judgment of God is according to truth against those who are doing what you're doing. Yet they've convinced themselves they're okay. Verse 3, do you think this, O man, you who judge those practicing such things and yet doing the same? That you will escape the judgment of God. Somehow you're special. You're different. The same rules don't apply to you. Verse 4. Do you despise the riches of his goodness. Forbearance and long suffering. Not knowing. Here's our term being ignorant. Or unaware. Are you ignorant. Of the fact that the goodness of God. Leads you. To repentance. See, these individuals were wrongfully taking the law, not applying it to themselves, but applying it to others. Now, Paul isn't condemning the fact that the law very well might condemn these other individuals for doing things that are wrong. But you're doing the same things. And don't you see that you're kind of taking advantage of or making assumptions regarding God's goodness, his forbearance and long suffering? You're in essence kind of just tossing those away because he's waiting on you to realize your error. He's waiting on you to become knowledgeable. Are you ignorant that the goodness of God should lead you to repentance? Yes, they were. Instead of taking God's goodness and saying, hey, look how justified I am. Instead, they should have been taking God's goodness and giving them time to repent, taking God's word and then applying it to their lives. That's what they were supposed to have been doing. But they weren't. And the danger there is that, as he goes on to say in verse 5, in accordance with your hardness and impenitent heart, you are treasuring up for yourself wrath in the day of wrath and revelation at the righteous judgment of God, who will render to each one according to his deeds. You have an impenitent heart, Paul says. Where the goodness of God should make your heart one that is willing to do whatever God tells you. You're still trying to do what you want. But what makes it worse is that they're not just accepting the fact, yeah, I do what I want. I know judgment's waiting for me and I don't care. Instead, what are they doing? I'm doing what I want and I'm going to take God's word. I'm going to justify myself. I'll condemn everybody else, but I'm not going to, to, to apply it to myself. Jumping to Romans chapter 6 now. Notice how the concept of ignorance is applied here in Romans chapter 6. As it applies specifically to how these brethren are to be living their lives faithful to the Lord. Because in Romans chapter 6 and in verse 1. He's dealt with the concept of grace a little bit in Romans chapter 5 at the end of Romans chapter 5. And then kind of preempts the argument that ironically many people, many religions in the religious world today make in verse 1. What shall we say then? Having considered the fact that we're under grace in Romans 5, shall we continue in sin 
so that grace may abound? See, the the hypothetical argument, or perhaps even a real argument, that Paul is addressing in Romans 5 is the idea that the more I sin, the more God's grace abounds to me. And if that's the case, then I should sin as much as I can, because then that's all the more grace I receive. In other words, I should live the way I want to, and that'll make me saved. That's the grace God's going to bestow upon me. Paul says, so what shall we say then to this concept of grace? Shall we continue in sin? Notice this is living in sin, living lives, doing what you want. So that grace may abound? Certainly not, Paul says. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Notice the emphasis that Paul's placing on the change that was supposed to take place because of what we just talked about, repentance. Repentance. Repentance is acknowledging, informed by God's word, there's your knowledge, acknowledging what God's word says about right and wrong, and then turning my life to do what he wants me to do. Well, if that's applied all the way through the way it should be, Paul shouldn't have to say what he's saying. But instead, he's having to say, don't you know that we who died to sin, here's the change that was supposed to take place when we became Christians We died to sin. No longer am I going to live for myself. I'm going to live for God. Thus, verse 4. Sorry, sorry, verse 3. Do you not know? There's your term, ignorant. Are you ignorant of the fact that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus, were baptized into his death? And we've mentioned before both the functionality and the symbolism of baptism contained here. The functionality that Paul refers to, you were baptized into. That term into means you were put into the place. You were put into Jesus. You were put into his body. He uses the same concept in Galatians regarding those who are children of God. For through faith we've been baptized into Christ Jesus. Well, here in verse 3, as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. Therefore, what? Therefore, you should have changed. You should be a new creature, verse 4. Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. You're supposed to be different than what you used to be. You're not supposed to be living in the same, doing the same things you used to do that were sinful because what? Knowledge has informed you of what God's will is. Knowledge tells you what's right and wrong. Verse 6, knowing this, Knowing versus ignorant. Knowing this, that our old man, the man of sin, the man who was dedicated to doing what we wanted to do, he was crucified with Christ. That the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. And instead what? Instead we should be servants of God. Verse 12. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in its lusts. Do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. Verse 14, and I mentioned before how someone quoted to me the second half of verse 14. You're not under law, but you're under grace. And kind of plucked that out of his context to say, there's no more law. And yet everything Paul's applying here has to do with knowledge of right and wrong. That's law. That's what law is. The knowledge of right and wrong. God has placed right and wrong before us. What does Paul say in verse 14? For sin shall not have dominion over. Not that it cannot have dominion over you. Like sin, it's impossible for sin to apply anymore because it just kind of, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't stick to me anymore. I can do what I want and I can live how I want and I can do whatever and it's fine. That's the very argument Paul is speaking against in verse 1. The very way that people apply verse 14 is the very thing within the context of verse 1. Paul says is not accurate. Let's continue to sin that grace may abound. We can live how we want to. There's no more law. That's not true. Thus, verse 14, sin shall not have dominion over you. Why? Because you're not under law, under grace. The concept of under law, meaning the law is not to condemn you. That's what law does. Law condemns. It doesn't set free. It condemns. Well, you as Christians, here's what God's law says. 
it should serve to, to guide you into how you're supposed to live. It should not serve to condemn you because you're supposed to be new. And yet so many people take that and misapply it. Being ignorant, not only of God's law, but not aware that Satan is taking advantage of them by their ignorance. In Romans chapter 10 and in verse 1, Paul makes no bones about the fact that ignorance is going to lead people to be lost. It's going to happen. Romans 10 and verse 1, Paul makes it very clear that he wants Israel to be saved. He says, brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. There's no doubt about it. Paul wishes Israel to be saved. But what's the problem, Paul? I bear them witness. They have a zeal for God, but it's not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness, they have not submitted to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Why can't Israel be saved, Paul? Because they refuse to accept Jesus and what he said. That's why. And as he goes on a little bit further here in chapter 10, they refuse to confess with the mouth that he is the Lord Jesus, the Son of God. They refuse to believe that he was raised from the dead. They refuse to accept Jesus as the Messiah. Therefore, they can't be saved. There's no way for them to be saved. And why is it? It's because of ignorance. And in this particular case, I would suggest that in some, some individuals' cases, it's willful ignorance. Think about the Sanhedrin and the multiple times they had at their disposal proof positive that Jesus was the Son of God. He raised up Lazarus from the dead, Jesus had. It was being, it was spread, news was spreading like wildfire. And what did the Sanhedrin decide to do? We're going to kill Jesus and kill Lazarus to get rid of the proof. That's what they decided to do. Satan can't raise people from the dead. And yet here's Jesus who did it. Later on, we have uh, Peter, uh, uh, Peter and John who healed this lame man out of the temple that a notable miracle has been done, we cannot deny. They personally said that. We can't deny that a notable miracle has been done. That's the work of Jehovah. And remember what Peter and John said? That it is in the name of Jesus. It's in his name this man was made whole. What did the Sanhedrin decide to do? But let us threaten them not to teach in the name of Jesus anymore. They're going to sweep it under the rug. Willful ignorance they didn't want to know because if they allowed themselves to have that knowledge and to let it sink into their hearts what did it mean it meant that the messiah they were waiting for the messiah that they wanted to reestablish their physical kingdom wasn't coming and that they were wrong in the things that they thought pertaining to the messiah they didn't want to think about that they didn't want to accept that the same thing happens today Maybe not so much in the, the concept of the, the politics the way the Jews did, but in every person's life. When they come face to face with God's word, sometimes they might say to themselves, or if you were to put their thoughts into their mind, I believe that Jesus is the Christ. I believe he's the Messiah, but I'm not willing to actually do what he tells me to do. When faced with the words of Jesus in John 14, if you love me, you keep my commandments, many people are perfectly content <coughs> To say Jesus never said that. Or Jesus' commandments, and I have actually heard this one. Jesus' commandments are that we love one another. That's all. That's all that means. Just that we're to love one another. Has nothing to do with, with right and wrong or sin or anything. Just that we love each other. When Jesus told the apostles in Matthew 28, as they're going to all the world, teach, teaching the nations, baptizing the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things... That I've commanded you. That doesn't just include loving each other. There's far more to it than just that. Ignorance is dangerous. In Romans 1 and in verse 16. Paul says I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. For the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it. For in it. 
the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. For as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Well, what did the Jews refuse to do? They, refused, they were ignorant of God's righteousness. They sought to establish their own standard of right and wrong and refused to submit to the standard that Jesus brought. Well, Paul says the standard that Jesus brought is the only power to salvation. And those who refuse to acknowledge either willful or not are going to be held accountable to it. And it's for this reason, I don't have this scripture up there, I should have put it up there, but it's for this reason in Acts chapter 17 when Paul's at Mars Hill, why God calls on all men everywhere to repent. It's for that reason. Because ignorance of the law is no excuse. In Psalm 119, the first 48 verses, all of them apply to a certain extent. A lot of these, these verses of, of uh, verses 1 through 48 of Psalm 119 focus on the word of God and knowing the commandments and the statutes of the Lord. But I want you to notice a couple. Verse 2, the psalmist says, Blessed are those who keep his testimonies, who seek him with the whole heart. Because it shouldn't be about what I want and how I can kind of manipulate God's word to make it justify what I want to do. It's about seeking what God wants. The whole concept of godliness. Godliness is the desire to please God, not myself. It's about pleasing God. Verse 4, Psalm 119. You have commanded us to keep your precepts diligently. That takes focus and determination. That takes a willingness to dwell on what God's word says. Verse 9, how can a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed according to your word. That's how a young man can cleanse his way. And it's notable that the psalmist mentions a young man. Especially young men today and, and the types of, of ways in which young people, how we're bombarded with so many temptations by Satan. We're not ignorant of Satan's devices. God doesn't leave us ignorant or unequipped to deal with Satan's devices. How shall a young man cleanse his way? How can young people make sure they're doing what God wants them to do? Take heed according to his word. Verse 15, I will meditate on your precepts and contemplate your ways. I will delight myself in your statutes. I will not forget your word. One of the dangers of ignorance, one of the wiles of the devil, the devices he uses, is to allow that forgetfulness to kind of pop in. That apply, that's still ignorant. It might be willful ignorance. It might be ignorance by, by association of, of time, and so I've forgotten because I haven't been dwelling on it or thinking about it. This is why verse 5, 15 is so important. I will meditate in your precepts. Contemplate your ways. Why? So that he won't forget his word. Verse 18. Open my eyes that I may see wondrous things from your law. I love verse 18. Open my eyes. It's like a prayer to Jehovah. Open my eyes so that not only will I remember the things that I've already learned, but that I will continue to grow and learn in the things that your word tells me. That takes determination. And it is the exact opposite of a character seeking ignorance. A character that's okay with being ignorant. A character that sits back and says, okay, well, you know what? I've, I've done what God told me to do. I was baptized. I, I go to worship on Sunday. I go to Bible class Wednesday night. That's all I need. I'm done. Now I can kind of skate through life just doing the bare minimum that I need to do. And I don't really need to continue to grow. And yet, what did Peter deal with so often in both First and Second Peter? But the need for the saints to continue to grow. Why does he say, add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge? And Why? If I've already got a little bit of those things, Peter, then shouldn't that count? We're not ignorant of Satan's devices. Add to your faith, virtue to virtue, knowledge, knowledge, temperance, and so forth. If these things are yours and abound, Peter said, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful. 
and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. In the knowledge of. Why? That's the opposite of ignorance. That's why. You're seeking to continue to grow. There was an English philosopher back in the early 1900s named Aldous Huxley. And he had this statement. He said, most ignorance is vincible ignorance. We don't know because we don't want to know. And if that was true back in the early 1900s, they didn't have access to the internet. They didn't have access to cell phones. They didn't have access to computers. They didn't have access to libraries of books. They couldn't go onto their app and search for a single word or a term or a phrase and see all everywhere in the, in the Bible that that phrase is used. We have access to that. In the end, especially for us living in what we call the information age or age of information, <coughs> ignorance really is willful ignorance. If we don't know something, it's because we haven't taken the time to learn it. Amen. Now, that doesn't mean that I learned it all on my own. Maybe I, I study with someone. Maybe I study with a group of people and I learn and I grow. But if I don't know, it's my fault that I don't know. God has equipped us to, with all of the, the knowledge that we need, everything that pertains to life and godliness. And he has not left us at the mercy of the devices of Satan. We offer an invitation this morning to those who are not Christians to understand Satan is using those devices on you this very moment. Because you might be fighting in your heart right now the fact that you know Jesus taught, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. You know, Paul says in Acts chapter 2 and verse 38 to the Jews, repent and be baptized every one of you. You know, Ananias told Paul, Arise and be baptized. Wash away your sins calling on the name of the Lord. You know that. But Satan is going to use his devices. He's going to use ignorance. He's going to use that desire for you to continue to live the life you want to live. To try to convince you that it's okay for you to do that. Don't let ignorance cause you to lose your soul. We offer an invitation this morning also to those who are Christians. We can never forget the need to continue to grow, continue to push ourselves, continue to add to our knowledge of God's word. Not a single person in here, and I don't care how many times you've read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, not a single person in here can say they know everything they could possibly know. Not one of us can say that. We continue to grow. And unfortunately, in those areas where maybe we don't know as much as we ought, Satan can dwell there and he can throw up all these different traps for us and lead us to do the very same thing. Romans chapter two convince us that we can apply God's word to everybody else, but we don't have to because we're Christians. And so it doesn't apply to us the way it applies to everybody else. Let's make sure we're living the life that God wants us to live, seeking to please him according to knowledge, not according to ignorance. We offer an invitation if you're subject to forward as we stand and sing. Live.